welcome everyone to Imago Day. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here again with a new interview. And in this time, I have two guesses. Uh, well, the first will be my co-host, um, my dear friend, Priscilla from Seca. So, uh, Priscilla, thank you for being here. No, thank you for inviting me. I'm very, very excited to to join you in this special, special interview. Yeah, and also uh, we're joining by Dr. Jennifer Wisman. So, Dr. Wisman, we're very thankful that you are here. Thank you for accepting this interview. I'm very happy to be here with you today. So, um, maybe for before we start with the you know the whole topic for today's interview, there will be some uh, people, some friends who don't know what you do, who you are. Could you interview introduce a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I am an astronomer. That means I'm a scientist. And uh, um, as astronomers, we use different types of, of telescopes to look deep into the heavens, deep into the night sky, and study things about planets and stars and galaxies, scientific things. We want to understand um, what they are composed of, how they form, how they operate and interact and, and how our universe is very active, um, what's going on in the solar system, what's going on in the distant universe, and how things uh, change over time. So um, I love the study of space. I like the idea of space exploration. And, but I did not grow up, you know, knowing anything about science. I grew up on a, on a farm in the rural part of, of my home country. And we loved the natural world because I was able to go outside and I loved seeing the, the forests and we had streams and lakes and beautiful rivers nearby that I enjoyed seeing. And I loved seeing a lot of wildlife, animals of all kinds, as well as the animals that we own. And I loved looking up at the night sky. So this wonderful um, appreciation of nature is what I grew up with. And then I found out that with science, you can study things about how nature works. Um, and I am so grateful for that. And then I also grew up in a Christian family and in a loving church. And they also encouraged us to love the study of the natural world because we believe that it's God's creation. So anything that we study about the natural world should uh, should honor God. And so that's that's part of my background. And then I had the privilege of studying science at the university and and then going on to specifically learn how to do scientific study of space through astronomy. Great. Great. Thank you so much for, for that so we can know, uh, get to know you a little bit better. But in the same line, you know, I would like if you can um, tell us a little bit about your faith journey, you know. We'll be we're going to unpack the idea of the conflict between science and faith through the whole interview. But there are people who think that they're kind of strange, you know, that to see a scientist that also is a Christian, committed Christian. So yeah, tell us, how do you become a Christian? So for me, my my Christian faith came first because I I grew up in a, an environment where I was taught about Jesus uh, in my family and also in our church. And I experienced the love of God through my family and through our church. Um, we were not perfect people, of course, but, but I still uh, experienced both hearing the gospel, hearing about Jesus, and then seeing God's love lived out in the lives of people in my family and in community. And so I'm thankful for that. And at some point along the line, I think in my teenage years, I learned and I understood that being a Christian was not just something that you inherit by being born into a Christian family, nor is it something just to know in my head, it was something that had to be in my heart, that I had to uh, um, ask God to be my uh, Savior, to, to 
realized that I could either live just for myself, a self-centered life, or the other extreme is what God asks of us is that we accept God's forgiveness for our sin in Jesus and receive from him a new life. Because Jesus has died for our sins, and Jesus has been raised to life again, and God offers us the gift of new life that lasts eternally, but we need to give our whole lives unto him. So at uh, at some point in my youth, I did, in fact, um, ask Jesus to to save me and to be my Lord and Savior And so from that point on, it really was a matter of learning how do I walk with Jesus in different phases of my life? How do I follow him in each new age and each new place where I've lived, each new situation? Every day for all of us brings a new challenge or a new situation. And for followers of Jesus, it means looking every day to Jesus for guidance and help and growing and maturing in our faith. Now, that was happening at the same time that, as I said, I was loving the natural world. I love hiking. I love seeing animals. I love um, everything about nature. And um, as I began to more formally study science in the university, the question would be, well, how do you study the natural world scientifically while also keeping a strong faith that this is God's creation. And for me, this was not a problem, and it never has been. This is a, 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 a very much of a harmonious relationship, because to me, science is a wonderful tool that God gives us to help us understand the particulars of how the natural world works. God doesn't give us all these details in the Bible. We he tells us the, the grand story that God is responsible for creation, but then we learn through chemistry and biology and astronomy and geology, we learn a lot of the wonderful details of God's creation. Now, does that ever produce some kinds of, of um, a, a misunderstanding or tension? Uh, for some people, yes, because sometimes when we read something in Scripture, it might seem to speak to some very specific details of creation that might seem to conflict with what science is telling us, like about the age of the universe or about how different species of life came to be. To me, this is a question of humility. We need to realize that God hasn't told us all the details of the natural world or of how he has created the the world in scripture. He's given us the gift of science to learn those details, but also humility towards science. Science does not give all the answers. Some people think that science is kind of like a God that will tell us everything. But science is not meant for that. Science is a a specific tool that helps us to understand how the forces of nature work. But science does not have the power to tell us why we are here in in the grand scheme of things and, and how we should live and whether God exists and how we have a relationship with God. These are things gleaned from scripture and from God's spirit. So to me, we have to learn to use the right tool to answer the appropriate question that goes with that kind of tool. We use science to answer questions about nature. We use scripture and the word of God and our own experience with God to answer bigger questions about why we are here and how we should live and how we have a relationship with God. So I, when I, when I keep in mind that sense of humility toward what we know from scripture and what we know from science, I think that has helped me not to have a conflict and i don't think there needs to be a conflict you know it's it's really all god's uh, uh, creation and god's doing so of course what we see in the natural world cannot ultimately conflict with the god who created it so i think any sense of conflict we experience now is simply because we don't know everything yet we need a sense of humility i uh, i was um moved by your testimony because Every time I take a look at the sky and and see all the stars in the night, I, I, that's what happens. You just feel that um, you feel so small. Like, uh, how can this 
great God create all this and and make make us like his image and so I was just like oh I'm very thankful for um people like you that could help us um on this bridge with science and faith so thank you for that um Dr. Wiseman and let me, um, let me just say a little bit more if, if you don't mind let me just say one more thing which is I think sometimes in my the way I was taught growing up we thought of of creation as being stagnant, you know, that God created everything in six days and that it's just been sort of stagnant. But really, when you look into the biblical, the original languages, that isn't what was being conveyed. What was being conveyed is that God is responsible for all of creation. And what we're learning through science is that the creation is very active, you know, that stars are still forming, that um, that things are, are in, in movement for long periods of time. And that's part of the grandeur of God's power. So, so some of it is, is our own mental imagery um, is sometimes um, too small. We have to, to expand our, our understanding of the time and the space that God uses in his active creation. Absolutely. And um, regarding this um, uh, comment of yours, how would you think of about um, Christians pursuing a career in science? Well, uh, this is very exciting. So you, you mentioned um, the comet, I think. And um, I was in the university studying science, and I didn't know much about astronomy yet. Uh, I had just taken maybe one or two introductory classes. But fortunately, one of the professors at the university took every year a group of students out to a real observatory, a real professional telescope where we could learn what astronomers actually do with, with professional telescopes. So I went on one of those, they called it a field trip, and uh, and was just learning from a real astronomer how to use telescopes and images from telescopes to study comets and asteroids. These are small bodies in our own solar system orbiting the sun, but they're not as big as a planet or a moon. They're small things. And I was just learning to analyze these images. And um, and on the first day, I saw something on one of the images that didn't look like what he thought I would see as, as a bunch of asteroids that he expected me to see. I saw something a little more um, streaking across the field, and it turned out to be a comet that had not yet been discovered. And so um, I went back out with astronomer whose name is Brian Skiff, and uh, he found it again uh, uh, in the sky. We had to kind of guess where it might have moved over a few days. And uh, it was confirmed to be a newly discovered comet. So I'm very grateful uh, for this uh, uh, gift. But it reminds me, right, reminds me every time this comes up that studying the universe or studying anything about nature is a great gift of God. And it can be used in a way that really honors God because you know, God is responsible for the universe. Surely he wants us to understand it and to use that knowledge in a way that uplifts others because God is love. And so the more we understand about the universe, you know, uh, Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So the more we're studying and learning about the universe, the more we're understanding the glory of God and, and the more we can uh, help other people. And I think that's true with other kinds of science as well, as we're studying the, the, the biology, the, the life on earth, or, or even a, a practical uses of science in medicine um, and, like, and things like that. We can use the knowledge of science to draw people both to have a richer appreciation of God and also to uplift one another here on planet Earth. And so I definitely believe that a a career in, in science and technology fields can be a great way of being a disciple of Jesus Christ and of following him and using the talents that he gives us to study his creation and to use this knowledge in ways that honor God. 
human. <laughs> I also believe that we need more people in science and in, in engineering and technical fields. Um, and so I encourage people, young people and their parents to consider going into a scientifically related field. Um, it can be a very good career and, and a way that's um, that's fruitful and that can be used to help our world. Of course, science and technology are only as good as what they're used for. So, of course, sometimes science and te technology are used for very bad things. We can see that throughout human history. But science and technology can also be used for very good things. And so I, I think uh, it's it's a good uh, field to go into. And I also encourage uh, Christian young people to think about science as a way of serving, as a way of, of honoring God and, and using these talents to uh, to to be, in fact, um, a missionary, in a sense, of, of serving God in, in the field of science and technology. So uh, we also, if you're interested in space exploration, it's not only science and engineering that are talents that are needed. We also need people who uh, can do computer programming or, or computer software development. We need all kinds of engineering. We need also people who are able to uh, teach and write about what we're learning in space. Uh, we even need artists and, and writers to express what we're learning uh, in ways that people can appreciate. And we need people in governments and leadership roles who can talk about supporting the use, uh, the peaceful uses of space for ways that, that help humanity. Um, we need lots of different career specialties uh, in, in the, the, the study of space. Great, great, yeah. And well, you are more related in these studies, you know, of the universe. So I would like to ask you what exciting new things are you or are the people that are, you know, the scientists discovering about the universe through astronomy? Oh, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> um, right now, it's a very exciting time in astronomy because we have these new telescopes um, that are in space, some of them, they're put in space to get them above the Earth's atmosphere so we can see more clearly into deep space. But we also have some very good telescopes on the ground that can do things that, that cannot be done as easily from space. So astronomers are using all these different kinds of telescopes to learn new things about the universe. And these telescopes can see different kinds of light as well. Some of them see the colors of light like our eyes can see, visible colors. But a lot of things in the universe are radiating their, their light in colors that we cannot see. So the, the, the energetic light that's bluer than blue, we call ultraviolet light or X-rays. These high energy uh, uh, forms of radiation are often emitted where stars are forming in other galaxies or even where we have explosions of old stars in supernova uh, explosions or things energetic. And then on the other side of the visible light spectrum, the rainbow that we see, we have the redder than red infrared light or even the lower energy radio waves that these big dish telescope, dish-shaped telescopes pick up, they tell us a lot about what's going on deep inside these interstellar clouds of gas and dust, things we couldn't see into with just visible light, but infrared light can escape and radio waves can get out. And that's where we see new stars and planets still forming. So what's exciting? A, a lot, but one of them is this whole realm of continual formation of new stars. That's my own field of research and expertise. I've used these big dish-shaped radio telescopes um, out in the deserts to observe into these thick interstellar clouds between stars, and we can see these infant protostars forming. So learning about that process is very exciting. But we're also learning that most stars now are actually forming with planets around them. 
you know, back when I was in, in university, we did not know of any planets orbiting stars other than our sun. We knew about our sun and we knew about our solar system, the planets like Earth that orbit the sun. But we did not know if there were any planets orbiting around other stars because we didn't have the right kind of telescope to be able to detect them. But in recent years, newer telescopes and technologies have started being capable of detecting planets orbiting other stars. Um, we call them exoplanets because exo means outside of our solar system. So exoplanets have been discovered. And now we know of thousands of star systems that where we have detected planets and by doing the statistics, we now understand that most stars in our Milky Way galaxy have planets. Um, so that's very exciting. And so now we're trying to build even more sophisticated telescopes that can tell us more details about those planets. Are they similar to the ones in our own solar system or are they different? Um, we can already say that many of them are quite different than the planets in our own solar system but that many of them have at least water vapor and interesting things like that. So we would like to know if any of these planets are even habitable. Could they harbor simple life? And how would we be able to detect it? They're too far away for us to go there in person, but how could we detect even simple biology going on there from telescopes we have near Earth? So that's an exciting field in, in astronomy right now. And kind of on the other end of the size scale is the study of the universe as a whole. That means looking at the distribution of all the galaxies. A galaxy is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars and their planets and all the gas and the unseen dark matter within these galaxies that are held together by gravity. We are, our solar system is in the Milky Way galaxy. But we now know there are billions of other galaxies and some of these astronomical images like the deep fields are really mind blowing because they show us how many galaxies are out there. And we can't even comprehend with our minds what it means to have hundreds of billions of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. And maybe those stars have planets. You know, so it's really a vast universe. And what we're discovering now is that this universe is not only expanding, but that dark energy is accelerating that expansion. Um, and we can kind of see now how galaxies over time have uh, have become distributed in the ways they are, because astronomy is kind of like a time machine. As we look at anything in space, we're seeing it as it was in the past because it's taken time for the light to get to our telescope. And so that can be a few years for nearby stars, but it can be thousands of years for stars more distant to us in our galaxy. And it can be millions or even billions of years for other galaxies. So we can see what the universe was like in the past by looking deeper and deeper into space. And we can see that the universe over time has become more hospitable to life, that stars have come and gone and they produce heavier elements that enable planets like Earth to have what we need for life. So I think of all of this as sort of like God's factory for his amazing creation. And we're learning about this expanding universe through our telescopes today. It's a very exciting time in astronomy. I can't even picture everything that you're just describing is just so amazing. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of new on, in astronomy and all that thing. But uh, every time I just uh, hear a new data or, of information, I just, I don't know, it just blows my mind uh, of this. Great. I've just changed. I've just changed. I just changed my background here. So you could see what I mean by a deep field. This is a picture uh, um, from the Hubble telescope that shows us deep space. These are not stars in our own galaxy. These objects, most of them are other galaxies, each of them containing billions of stars. And if we could get far enough away out of our own Milky Way galaxy and look back, 
our galaxy would look like one of these little smudges of light. And of course, we're seeing these from different epochs of time because some of them are farther away than others and it's taken longer for the light to get to us. Some of these are millions of light years away, some billions of light years. And our, you know, any direction you look in the, in the sky with a sensitive telescope, you see something similar. So we really live in, a, in an amazing vast universe and we live in a privileged time because it's only been the last century that we've known that there are these other galaxies. And now we know the universe is full of them. God knew it all along, you know, but we're just now learning about it. So, so it is truly a privilege. Yeah. I, I, I bet, I bet it is. So thank you for sharing all this knowledge. And what is the most, um, uh discovery that you found like that that touched you the most what was that thing yeah. that you discovered that was like mind blowing to you <laughs> well i think two things the, the thing that has blown my mind the most is is what you see behind me is is this deep feel i didn't do the observation myself but I think I could just stare at this picture for forever and it just never lose my sense of amazement. I wish I could blink my eyes and just suddenly go to one of these other galaxies and look around. Uh, just realizing how, you know, these little swirls of light are actually collections of hundreds of billions of stars and possibly planets Um with its own history, you know, uh, um, that's different from our Milky Way galaxy. That just inspires all kinds of imagination in me. Perhaps a sense of, a combined sense of insignificance as we feel when we see these things, but also a sense of significance in the sense that we've been given this privilege of, of learning about this, seeing this, you know, having a little more grasp of the vastness and the awe of, of the universe. And that gives me a great sense of gratefulness. I think closer to my own experience, I think being able to propose an observation with a pro professional telescope and then have that be accepted and being able to to um, kind of plan the observations, in my case, using these dish-shaped radio telescopes, having them do the observations, you know, point to some, some distant uh, a source in space, receive the information, and then being able to process that data with computer programs and things and understand and make maps of what we're seeing in my case, of these interstellar clouds where stars are still forming, that to me was also awe-inspiring, that I could kind of be a part of this enterprise of humanity learning something about the, the universe of which we are a part and kind of being a part of every step of a scientific investigation was has been awe-inspiring to me as well. Thank you. Great, great. That's that's awesome. And you know, uh, when I see that picture that is behind you and how the universe is so vast, and, and I bet you have heard this question a lot, but uh, it's raised the question about significance, you know, in, in human being, because the um, universe is so vast. There are people who think, well, we are just um, valueless, you know because we are just stardust or something like that. So, uh, but you're as a Christian scientist, what, what do you think about that? Um, mm. Do humans have meaning or value in such a vast universe? Well, that's a great question. And humans have been asking this question for a long time. Um, another beautiful Psalm in the Bible is Psalm 8, where the, the person writing the Psalm um, was looking up at the night sky and saying, um, Oh Lord, God, how majestic is your name. When I look at the sky, the sun and the moon and the stars, um, he didn't know about galaxies yet, but um, he said, you know, how amazing it is. But then he goes on to say, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, um, you know, what are we that you're mindful of us? You know, we're just mortals. And so I, I think that's a natural 
response to realizing that we are not in the center of the universe and we don't live very long and we aren't very big compared to uh, the universe around us. And of course, now we know that even more. We know that the earth is not in the center of the solar system and that our solar system is not in the middle of our Milky Way galaxy and that the Milky Way galaxy is just one of billions of galaxies like you see behind me here. And there does not seem to even be a center to the universe, that the whole universe is expanding, but there's no particular center to anything. So, it, and our lifespans are very short compared to the, the time scales of the universe. So in that sense, we are insignificant. But what that psalmist goes on to say in Psalm 8 is that, you know, and yet he says, you, God, have made us, you know, just a little bit lower than the angels. You've given us dominion over all things. Now, the psalmist didn't mean that we had the ability to touch and manipulate the stars and the moon. But I think what he was getting at is, is that we, we've been given the gift of, of understanding, of observing, of appreciating. And I think science fits into that. So I would say that while we, if if we think of significance as our time and place, um, not so much. Although in some sense, we are living in a significant time because science is enabling us to understand much more about the universe and our place in it than, than ever, ever before. But that to me is a gift of God and it's God's gift of understanding and God's love that makes us significant. And so even though the Bible in other places says that we are like the grass of the field that's here today and gone tomorrow, we are also told that because of God's great love, he knows everything about us. He knows the number of hairs on our heads that even a bird does not fall outside of the knowledge and care of God. So we understand that God's choice is to love us, that the universe has brought forth life under God's command, under God's natural processes, and that God has even sent himself in human form in Jesus Christ to our little planet um, to love us, to show us the nature of God, to die for our sins that would separate us from a righteous God and to be raised again to show us that God wants us to be uh, with him forever. In fact, Jesus said He's he wants us to be with him. So that's to me is an amazing, uh, amazing revelation. So it is that where we, I think, get our significance and our ability given to us to learn about the natural world that gives us a kind of significance. Um, but that's a philosophical question. And, and I know people from who have the same scientific view of the universe but can have very different philosophical interpretations and conclusions about our significance and uh, I, I think that's an interesting conversation to have thank you dr Weiswein. yes um we're uh, I, I don't know I, I every time i'm just listening to you i'm just thinking about god's grace and love for us and it just keeps amazing me but now I'm going to take you a little bit back to the Big Bang. <laughs> um, does the Big Bang provide an argument for the existence of God? Wow. So that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, uh, um, in the earlier part of the 20th century, there was a, a, a scientific argument going on. Some scientists were saying that the universe has always been here, just like it is. It's in a steady state. But the evidence was coming in, both from observation and from theoretical physics, that the universe, as we see it, must have had a beginning um, and must be expanding, must be changing over time. And so this was a disagreement. And the people who thought that the universe must have always been here in a stagnant, steady state, they made jokes about the other point of view by calling it the Big Bang Theory, because that implied that the universe began with some kind of a big explosion, and that seemed like a, 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 a joke. But actually, then, as more and more observations came 
through, including observations that indicated that galaxies like the one behind me are mostly moving apart from each other as the space itself is expanding. Um, that pointed in the direction toward our universe having had a beginning. And in fact, we now, uh, almost every astronomer believes that we had a beginning, still kind of that, that slang term still exists, the Big Bang, but but it's really more like a burst of energy everywhere because everywhere we look in the universe, every direction, we see something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And this was a theoretical prediction that if our universe did in fact begin in this spectacular way, we should see leftover cooled radiation from this expanded universe in every direction. And we do. A Nobel Prize was awarded for this discovery back in the 1970s. And now astronomers are more studying that background radiation in more detail and how that radiation from the early universe ended up transforming into matter that became galaxies and stars as we know them today. So this transformation of, from, of the universe from a burst of energy and inflation into an expanding universe of stars and galaxies and planets is spectacular and it's all an outworking of our universe having had a beginning which we still kind of call the big bang but that's that sometimes gives the wrong imagery that it's like a bomb going off in some place and then you wonder well where did that happen and it's not really like that it's more that all of space was very compact and this burst of energy happened everywhere um at at the at that moment so does that speak toward the creation that we read about in scripture well some people think that that does that 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 the big bang theory is actually more uh, congruent with what we see in genesis where where god uh, set forth the universe than a steady state theory where the universe has always been here and so one you know some christians actually use the evidence for the big bang as evidence for god because it shows that our universe had a spectacular beginning um and that can be done i i would caution a little bit because again the the, the language used in scripture was not really meant to be a scientific text you know, science wasn't even invented for many centuries later. So, um, so the, the 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 verbiage that is used in God's word to us in Scripture, like in Genesis, was meant to convey a very powerful message that we don't worship the stars, we don't worship the mountains, we don't worship the animals. We worship one God who is responsible for the creation of all of these entities. And that God set the stage through the universe, through the lights in the universe, um, through the earth for life to thrive. So when we understand the original literature, the original message, it's very powerful, but may not, may not be wise to try always to match word for word what we are seeing in scripture and what God's revealing there with what we're learning in science through the Big Bang and in fact, we may we may be inhabit something even more marvelous than our one universe. There are theories and ideas that there might even be other universes. We can't see them because we can't see outside of our own universe. But a multiverse, a multiverse uh, theory would posit that there might be other universes with other forces of nature and other other content. And all I can say to that is that would be marvelous. And it's still part of God's creation because the God of scripture that we read about is the God who's responsible for all there is. And so if there's a multiverse, God knows all about it and um, is, is uh, um, glorified in that as well. So I would, I, I'm answering that with a very long answer, but I think um it is it is possible to see the Big Bang theory as closely mirroring um, what we read in the Genesis account of Scripture, but I would be cautious about trying to force it too much because they're different types of knowledge. Yeah. Great, thank you, thank you for that. And just following that that line, um, I would like to ask you if we can use the Big Bang to explain from a naturalistic perspective? 
Well, I think we need to be careful that when we say something has a natural explanation, that does not mean that God was not involved, right? Because if God is the creator of nature, and if God is creator of natural forces, then that means that things created through natural processes are wonderful, and that if those natural processes work, that shows that God did a very good job in creating those natural processes. So it is it is not wise, I think, to try to, you know, prove God by showing something that cannot be explained through natural methods, because at some point, maybe we will be able to explain whatever that is through natural processes, and then what happens to God? So that's called the God of the gaps, where you try to, you know, put God into the places where science cannot fully explain um, how things have operated. And I don't think that's wise for Christians. But what we should do, actually, is, first of all, try to understand the scriptures and what their original audiences, the original languages, the original intentions of those scriptures are, and then, as we use the tools of science to understand the natural world, see how those things fit together. I do not see um, any conflict between the Big Bang theory, which basically says that our universe had a spectacular beginning and has been developing in marvelous ways ever since, with the revelation of God as creator and as the author of all creation, glorified in all things, and that God is also the author of life. So creating a universe that maybe over vast periods of time, but became habitable for life, at least on one planet, um, that to me is, is marvelously um, uh, congruent with our understanding of God and God's love for us. And in fact, um, as we understand what stars do, stars are just shining balls of gas that have collapsed under their own great weight, and we can understand them scientifically. We also understand that as a star is shining, the fusion process in, inside of it is, is creating heavier elements, starting with hydrogen, but creating things like helium and carbon and nitrogen and iron. And eventually those stars uh, release those heavier materials and they get caught up in subsequent generations of stars. That's the only way we know of that we can get some of the atoms in our own body, um, the carbon, the iron, so forth and so on. And so then we know that Jesus himself, God incarnate, was made like us in human flesh from the dust of the earth. And astronomically, we understand that the elements in the dust of the earth were created in other stars. We suddenly realize what it means when the Bible says that God became incarnate in the flesh, that God himself became part of this universe. And not just, you know, the earth isolated from the other stars, but that the stars and the earth are exchanging material. We actually are part of this active interactive universe and God is a part of that. I think that is the deeper, richer message that we can get from this. And so understanding the Big Bang and how the universe has developed since the Big Bang is very much to me aligned with our faith in God and the rich message of the gospel of Jesus Christ being God becoming flesh and living amongst us in the universe on planet earth. That's my own, uh, my own take on it. I would also add one more thing. Um, the Bible talks about the universe in many different places. So often we turn to the first few verses of Genesis, which are important, but we should also recognize that some of the most beautiful descriptions of God's creation are in other places as well, like in the Psalms or even in the latter chapters of the book of Job, where God proclaims his majesty through what you see in the heavens and the dynamics of the heavens. And so we should remember that the main message of scripture is not the details of how God started the universe, but rather that God is responsible for everything in the universe 
And God is to be glorified by what we observe and see. And I think that we can do that through what we learn in science, including through our appreciation of the beginning of our own universe. Thank you. And um, we, we would like to know what um, your take is on the complexity of the universe and the intel intelligibility of the universe. Um, do you think this provides evidence for a designer? Mm. Well, I certainly think that um, our universe is embedded with physical laws and properties that have enabled it over vast periods of time to develop into this array of galaxies that you see behind me. And within those galaxies, uh, billions upon billions of stars. And we now know, at least in our own Milky Way galaxy, that most stars have planets. And now we're working very hard to find out if any of those planets might even be able to support life. I think that's an exciting quest. It does to me, it does not seem that all of that would have taken place by complete accident. So even though I believe that we can follow and we should try to every step of this process through science and trying to understand the natural processes that bring forth all of this richness of our universe, um, That, as I've said before, does not mean that we are using that as a substitute for God. It just shows that that I believe that God's created processes that are very, um, very successful and productive. And there is, to me, no reason to have a universe that has life that can think about itself and have these conversations and recognize our own existence and and even recognize our own evil and our own fallenness and our need for something better than what we're doing, none of that to me makes any sense if it were just an accident, that if we are just a purposeless accident of nature. In fact, you can ask that very ancient philosophical question, Why is there anything at all? Why is there something and not nothing? Um, and the fact that our universe has, as we can actually see with our telescopes as time machines, has developed toward production of life and toward our ability to recognize ourselves, our needs, and our fallenness, um, our, our need for a relationship with God, to me, that speaks of purpose. Um, it doesn't make any philosophical sense otherwise to have a universe that has not been designed in this way. So I would say, yes, to me, it speaks of design and purpose. But notice that I have said to me, because I want to be careful that the same scientific observations that um, that I would interpret as pointing toward purpose and design When I say design, I mean sort of the fundamental principles of the universe that, that enable it to be as it is. Um, others might see the same information and conclude that there is no purpose and that, you know, we, we don't have purpose. So in some sense, this is a philosophical choice, but I do think the fact that we're having the conversation that we are today as human beings on planet Earth Uh, speaks to a grand purpose and a grand design. Thank you. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really great, Dr. Weisman. Um, and well, just moving to the end of the interview, um, I would like to uh, to ask you, you know, maybe in your in your experience, why do you think that for some scientists, you know, it's kind of hard. To believe in God or in Creator or an intranscendent of being. I think for um, for some people, whether they are scientists or not scientists, but they they learn about the the ways the natural world works. It seems as though maybe we can explain everything through scientific study, and we don't 
need uh, um, anything else. And in fact, you know, we know throughout human history that there's been a lot of myths and a lot of imaginations about, about things that we now know are not true because science has given us a better understanding. And so there can sometimes be this temptation to think that maybe our scientific understanding of the universe is all the truth that we need and is everything there is to know. But actually, I have found that for most of my scientific colleagues, whether or not they are personally religious believers, they understand that science is a limited tool. Science tells us about the way the natural world works, and, and science works very well to do that. But it is not capable of asking some of these deep or answering some of these deeper questions that we as humans have, such as we've just discussed. You know, is there a purpose for the universe? Um, how do we live our lives? Is there a God? Um, what does prayer, you know, what is prayer all about? Um, and who gets to decide what is good and evil? There are lots of ethical questions in our world, including about science and technology. How should we use the technology that we have? Um, there are ways that can be very harmful, and there are ways that are very helpful to, to, of using new technology. Who gets to make those ethical decisions, and where do those ethical values come from? These are questions beyond science. So science gives us information, but it doesn't give us the framework, the ethics, the values, and the, the answers to some of the bigger questions. And most of my scientific colleagues understand that, even if they, uh, some of them are devout religious believers, and some are not just as in the non-scientific world. Um, so I don't think, um, I actually don't think there are there is this sort of perceived conflict between science and faith, as as some people have heard there is. Even in my scientific community, I, I don't see a lot of that that conflict. It's it's really more discussed kind of in the popular culture, where I still hear some of this remnant conversation where um, where that people seem to assume that there may be some kind of conflict between science and and religion and in true that and, and and of course that's true when you come to very specific things about what science is teaching us and very specific interpretations of certain scriptures in certain religious faiths yes there can be conflict but in general um there is no conflict between science and religion because they are addressing different aspects of of our lives and of of reality so um, so I don't, uh, I, I actually don't see a lot of that conflict being even discussed in my scientific circles because people understand that it's not real. Thank you. And um, to wrap this interview, <laughs> um, what would you say or what would, you, what would your advice be to Christians who are afraid of studying science? Mm. I would say there's nothing, nothing at all to be afraid of. God is responsible for everything. So, so what God wants is people who love, who love Him, and and so uh, and God has loved us first. Remember that Scripture says that what is love? It's not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is the same God responsible for the universe or even the multiverse, if there is one. So, you know, there's nothing to fear. What I would say instead is there's a lot of things to be excited about. We need to learn more, not about not only about the universe around us, but also about in the biological realm. You know, there are many, many species of life that we've not yet identified that are in the oceans. And, and of course, God wants us to be good stewards. You know, can you imagine how God feels having created this amazing universe and this planet we live on that's teeming with life and oceans and beauty and to see humans, you know, kind of carelessly destroying um, a lot of the planet or, or, or not being conscientious about taking care of this beautiful planet um, surely that is hurtful to, to God. So we need to, to study science to take care of the God's creation 
that we live in, but also to care for one another. And, and, and I think for Christians, we should be excited about science. Science is exploring more and more about God's creation, teaching us more about how to use this knowledge um, for good. And Christians can always be thinking, whatever career path you're in, how can I use this in a way that honors God and that helps other people um, I find for me as a scientist, I, I not only take great joy from discovery of what we're learning about in the universe, but also with God's help of helping other people to be blessed by this knowledge, you know, people that don't have the privilege to actually go to telescopes and look at the universe, but who love to think about, as we all do, the majesty of God's universe and where we fit in. And also to enable students and other people to get involved in in science, whether that's in the classroom, just learning a new lesson, or or maybe walking out in, in nature and for the first time being quiet and listening to the streams or listening to the trees. Um, these are all things, I think, that help other people. And of course, science and technology can be used in very practical ways uh, as well as we try to help uh, people around the world who don't have enough to eat or don't have clean water, we can use technology to do that. I think we need to find better ways of treating animals on farms and and in labs and things. These are creatures God cares for as well. So and so Christians can be agents of helping us care for other people and other creatures on this planet as well. And that can all be seen as part of being a Christian disciple of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank sure. you for your interest. And I would just encourage everyone to to uh, stay curious and to go out sometime to a dark place. It's hard to find dark places now, but find a dark place when you can. Look up at the night sky and just allow yourself to be quiet and to be filled with awe and wonder once again. Um, I think that's something that is a spiritual experience that that hopefully everyone gets to have. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wiseman. Yeah, it has really been a pleasure uh, how you're here to listen to you. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate Thank you so much, please, for being here also. Um, and, and yeah, so thank you for your work and thank you again for taking your time. To, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.